Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft, and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video, we introduced the LU factorization method that allows us to write a square matrix in terms of the product of a lower triangular and upper triangular matrix. The LU factorization method is really useful for solving large linear systems of equations. Unfortunately, the basic LU factorization algorithm that we introduced can fail for some well-behaved matrices. In this video, we're going to take a look at why, and we're going to look at a resolution to this problem using a technique referred to as pivoting. This will lead to a modified LU factorization method that can work for all matrices. We'll also look at the Cholesky factorization method that's a specialization of LU for the case of symmetric positive definite matrices. In the previous video, we introduced the basic LU factorization where we can take a square matrix A and express it as a product of a lower triangular matrix L multiplied by an upper triangular matrix U. And we can use this LU factorization as a way to efficiently solve linear systems. Unfortunately, the basic LU factorization that we presented thus far can actually fail for some simple, well-behaved matrices. And as one example, let's look at the 2 by 2 matrix with entries 0, 1, and 1, 1. And this is a well-conditioned matrix. It has condition number equal to about 2.62. And we can easily solve matrix systems with this matrix using pen and paper. Unfortunately, if we apply our basic LU factorization to this matrix, then it will fail at the first step. And this is due to the presence of the zero in the top left entry. The LU factorization relies on row operations, where it subtracts copies of rows to eliminate terms below the diagonal. And since we have that zero entry here, we'll end up with division by zero errors when we try to use it to eliminate terms below the diagonal. Now, it's worth looking at a slightly perturbed problem. So let's now look at the case where we have A with entries of 10 to the minus 20, 1, 1, and 1. So if we applied our LU factorization now, then we could get a valid result. We'd have the L would have entries of 1, 0, 10 to the 20, 1, and U would have entries of 10 to the minus 20, 1, 0, 1 minus 10 to the 20. Now, if we're working with double precision, where our machine epsilon is around 10 to the minus 16, then it's likely that that number of 1 minus 10 to the 20 would not be representable within our finite precision system. And what we'd likely get is that would just be rounded to minus 10 to the 20. So in finite precision arithmetic, our LU factors would probably look like L tilde, which is just 1, 0, 10 to the 20, 1, and U tilde, which is 10 to the minus 20, 1, 0, minus 10 to the 20, so now that single one has been eliminated. Hence, due to rounding error, we'd actually now obtain that the product of L tilde U tilde would be equal to 10 to the minus 20, 1, 1, and now 0. And that is not close to the matrix that we started with. This could immediately lead to problems if we were trying to solve linear systems using these factors. For example, suppose that we put b is equal to 3 comma 3 as our source term, then if we used our finite precision factors L tilde and U tilde, we'd find that our numerical solution would be X tilde, which would be equal to just 3 comma 3. And the true answer is actually equal to 0 comma 3. So we're actually seeing here that we have a large relative error, even though we have a well-conditioned mathematical problem. So here we see then that standard Gaussian elimination actually leads to a large residual. Or equivalently, we see that it yields an exact solution to a problem corresponding to a large input perturbation. Delta B is equal to 0, 3. Hence, we're really seeing here an unstable algorithm. And in this case, the cause of the large error is due to the numerical instability and not ill-conditioning. And we'll now look at a way to stabilize Gaussian elimination. And we're going to use a technique referred to as pivoting. 
and this will involve permuting rows of our matrix. In Gaussian elimination, we select a term xjj on the diagonal, and we apply row operations to eliminate the terms in that column below the diagonal. But we could just as easily select a different term xij in that column, and apply row operations to eliminate the other terms in that column as shown. And here, that term xij is referred to as the pivot. And by using pivots, that provides us with additional flexibility in our LU factorization algorithm. And that can let us handle examples like this matrix A with entries 0, 1, 1, 1. And from a numerical stability point of view, we can actually select our pivots to be of largest magnitude in each column. And by doing that, this procedure is referred to as partial pivoting. And this will also ensure that the entries small l i j in our matrix L will actually have magnitude less than or equal to 1. To maintain the triangular LU structure, we can permute rows of our matrix by pre-multiplying by permutation matrices. So let's look at a particular step in our factorization. So here we've selected a term xij in the final row of our matrix. And we can apply a permutation matrix, P1, that will shift that row so that the matrix xij is now in the diagonal position. We can now apply our matrix L1, as before, to eliminate the terms below the diagonal in that column. And so in this case, our matrix P1 has the following form, and it has the action of just swapping two rows in our matrix. So therefore, with partial pivoting, we'll end up applying the following sequence to our matrix A. We'll apply the product ln minus 1, pn minus 1, ln minus 2, pn minus 2, up to L1, P1, onto A, and that will now give us our upper triangular matrix U. Now, we can actually show that this form can be rewritten so that P applied to A is equal to our factors L and U. And here, P will work out to be the product of Pn minus 1 multiplied by Pn minus 2, and so on, up to P1. I will omit the details here, although you can find them in the textbook by Trefethen and Bao. And there's a theorem that says that the Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting produces non-singular factors L and U, if and only if A is non-singular. Let's now revisit our basic LU factorization and incorporate the partial pivoting. So here, all the lines shown in black were from the original LU algorithm, and the lines shown in blue incorporate the pivoting. So at the start of the algorithm, we'll set up an additional matrix P that's equal to the identity, and that will track our permutations. And when we consider each column J, before we begin, we'll apply the pivoting operation. We'll select the entry i in the column under consideration of maximum magnitude in our matrix U. And we'll then apply row swaps to our matrices U, L, and P to account for the pivoting. And since these pivoting operations are applied in the outermost loop of the algorithm, they don't actually affect the asymptotic calculation number of floating point operations. And this will still be asymptotic to 2n cubed over 3 as before. So to solve a x equal b using this factorization of pa equal to lu, we can now take the following procedure. We can multiply our system through by our matrix p. So that will give us that p times a times x is equal to l times u times x which is equal to P times B. And we can then solve Ly is equal to PB. And we can finally solve that Ux is equal to Y. And we'll now take a look at doing these calculations in Python using the LU factorization routine with pivoting. We'll now take a look at Python's routines for calculating the LU factorization. And we'll first import the NumPy library and the LU factorization routine is actually contained within the scipy.linalg library. And 
we'll now go ahead and create a random 4x4 four four matrix. And so each entry in this matrix is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And we'll now call the LU factorization routine that's called scipy.linalg.lu. And this will return back three matrices, our permutation matrix P, and our lower and upper triangular factors L and U, respectively. And we'll actually note that there's a slight difference between the way that Python defines the permutation routine and the way that we defined it in the slides. So in the slides, we defined that the permutation matrix will satisfy that P times A was equal to L times U. And SciPy's routine actually returns just that A is equal to P times L times U. And this is just a different convention. The P here is just related to the, the P in the slides by an inverse factor. So let's now take a look at the P, L, and U for this case. So P here is this row permutation matrix. L here is a lower triangular matrix, and we see here, just as in the slides, that we have ones on the diagonal, and U is an upper triangular matrix. And we can now go ahead and verify that the factors multiply together as expected. So if we do P multiplied by L multiplied by U, then we'll get the following matrix. And we'll see here that this will indeed exactly agree with our matrix A that we defined previously. The numerical stability of Gaussian elimination has been an important topic since the 1940s. And a major figure in this field was James H. Wilkinson, who was an English numerical analyst. And Wilkinson showed that for Ax equal b, where you have an n by n matrix A, the Gaussian elimination without partial pivoting is numerically unstable, and that we've already seen. And if you use partial pivoting, then you find that the relative residual, the norm of r divided by the norm of a times the norm of x, is less than or equal to 2 to the n minus 1 times n squared times machine precision. So it's nice to have a bound here on our relative residual, but we do actually see here that the bound is rather weak due to this factor of 2 to the n minus 1. And if we consider a fairly large matrix, for example, n equal 100, then this factor will actually be very large and this bound will be rather weak. Indeed, pathological cases can exist where the relative residual, the norm of r divided by the norm of a times the norm of x, can grow exponentially with n due to rounding error. So we have the potential for an explosive instability. Thankfully, such pathological behavior is extremely rare. And in 50 years of scientific computing, this instability has only been encountered when explicitly constructing pathological cases. In practice, Gaussian elimination is stable in the sense that it produces a small relative residual. And we actually typically obtain that the relative residual is less than or equal to n times machine precision, so that it only grows linearly with n and is scaled by machine precision. Combining this result with our inequality that the norm of delta x divided by the norm of x is less than or equal to the condition number times the relative residual implies that in practice, Gaussian elimination gives a small error for a well-conditioned problem. We'll now look at the Cholesky factorization, which is a variation of the LU factorization for a specific class of matrices. And here, we look at matrices A, the n by n, that are symmetric and positive definite, that we often abbreviate as SPD. So the symmetry here tells us that A transpose is equal to A, and if the matrix is positive definite, that tells us that for any non-zero vector V, V transpose times A times V is greater than zero. And in this case, the LU factorization can be arranged so that our upper triangular matrix is just equal to L transpose. And that therefore gives us that A is equal to L times L transpose. The one slight generalization from what we had before is that our L factor may no longer have ones along the diagonal. And 
The Cholesky factorization is actually rather straightforward to calculate. And to see this, let's look at a two by two example. So here, we're looking at a matrix A here with entries of A11, A21, A21 again because of symmetry, and A22. And we're going to make that equal to our factors of L times L transpose. And if we actually multiply out the terms on the right hand side here and equate the A components to the L components, then we find that we can just directly read off what the L components will be. We find that L11 is just equal to the square root of A11. L21 is equal to A21 divided by L11. And L22 is equal to the square root of A22 minus L21 squared. And this procedure can be generalized to n by n matrices. And we find that there's a direct method where we just construct each term Lij in our factor L. And this leads to the following algorithm that bears some similarity to our previous LU factorization algorithm. And there are several notes on the Cholesky factorization. Firstly, for an SPD matrix A, we find that the Cholesky factorization is numerically stable and does not require any pivoting as we needed for the LU factorization. If we do an operation count, we find that the Cholesky factorization requires n cubed over three operations, and therefore requires about half the number of operations as we use for Gaussian elimination in the LU factorization. And finally, we only need to store one factor L in the Cholesky factorization, rather than both L and U. And this makes some sense because our matrix that we're looking at here is symmetric and therefore rather than having a total number of n squared degrees of freedom, it roughly has n squared divided by 2 degrees of freedom. So it therefore makes sense that we can factorize this matrix using just a single triangular factor.